Okay, I'm very happy to, to introduce our, our panel today, starting on, uh, on the far of my right of the stage with Senator Peter Beam, the moderator for today. Uh, Senator Beam was appointed to the Senate of Canada in October of 2018, where he currently is the chair of the Senate Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and International Trade, uh, prior to which he had a long and distinguished career uh, in the Canadian Foreign Service. Next to him is His Excellency, uh, the Ambassador Yamanuchi Kanji, Japan's ambassador to Canada. The ambassador has had a long and distinguished diplomatic career himself, having served in uh, senior political and diplomatic postings around the world, including in the United States, Korea, and in several senior roles within Japan, including as a senior advisor to ja the Japanese Prime Minister. And then next to me is Goldie Hyder, the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Business Council of Canada. Founded in 1976, the Council is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization composed of the chief executives and entrepreneurs of Canada's leading companies. Members collectively employ 1.7 million Canadians across the country in every major industry. And joining us on the screen, um, and if you can hear me, just put, give me a thumbs up there, Ambassador, please. Excellent. Always the first moment when we see whether or not the technology worked. So fingers crossed here. Uh, joining us from Switzerland is uh, Ambassador Nadia Theodore, uh, our ambassador to the World Trade Organization and permanent representative of Canada to the permanent mission of Canada in Geneva, Switzerland. Previously, uh, the ambassador was director of negotiations for Canada during the Trans-Pacific Partnership talks. And most recently, she was a senior vice president at Maple Leaf Foods. Uh, and she's going to be joining, obviously, this discussion virtually. Uh, Senator Beam, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have the distinct pleasure today of moderating a president and two ambassadors, one of which will be looking over my shoulder. So <laughs> if you see my neck going back and forth, you'll know there's lots going on. Um, this is a propitious occasion, um, and uh, we've got a beautiful day, of course, with all the sunlight uh, streaming in. Um, and we are, of course, at a critical juncture. So this, this uh, globally, so this panel is going to focus a bit more on the international side, probably uh, to no one's surprise. And I'd like to uh, kick it right off with uh, Ambassador Yamanuchi uh, Kanji. Um, you, um, of course, represent the third largest economy uh, in our country. Uh, Japan has also taken the chair uh, of the G7. Uh, and one of the major themes, of course, will be food security or is food security. And uh, all of the deliberations that will lead to your summit will, uh, will involve that. But I'd like you maybe to begin uh, with uh, Japan's interest uh, in Canadian products. I know you and I have had a conversation about uh, the things that, uh, that you like, um, but also um, whether uh, there are specific uh, needs in Japan right now, and could you set that into a regional uh, context as uh, well, whether it is CPTPP or, or, or otherwise. So first of all, thank you so much for having me here. I'm so excited, and food security is everybody's subject for today, and it's so important. And so, Senator, you just asked the, uh, the Japanese situation. So I'll tell you, so yes, the Japan is the third largest country. Our GDP is about $5 trillion. But do you know our food sufficiency rate? Japan's land is much smaller than this big country. Actually, Canada is 27 times as big as the size of Japan. And our food, food sufficiency rate, based upon the FAO uh, statistics and also based upon calories, 38%. 38%. That means we have to import food. So that is the matter of life and death. So the Japanese foreign policy and security policy is based upon very much this notion. So we try to make sure that uh, all those uh, trading system is secured and food security is everybody's subject in Japan. Therefore, we see today's world under the, under the influence of the pandemic, over crisis in Ukraine, and also endangered uh, supply chain. So the, this food security is so, so critical. And also uh, uh, global warming affects very much. So Japanese consumers are very much interested in this uh, safe safety food and food security. That's what we, uh, we are now. Therefore, the Senator, you just mentioned uh, G7 uh, leaders meeting, uh, which will be held in Hiroshima. But at the same time, the Japanese government will host 14 different ministerial meetings under the G7. 
including agricultural ministers meeting. So the food security will be discussed in a very extensive way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goldie Heider, you bring the business perspective, uh, of course. Where are, where do you see uh, Canadian vulnerabilities in terms of our agri-food products? Uh, and uh, I'll throw another one at you, and maybe you can answer this uh, this later. You were recently at the North American Leaders Summit in uh, in Mexico City. Uh, we, of course, do operate to the extent that we can as a trading bloc uh, as well. And are there any lessons that you would take from that that would go to my first point about our, our vulnerabilities and our strengths? Well, thank you, uh, Peter, and thank you for having me. Um, I hope it's not too late to still wish people a happy new year. It's still the first month, so I hope it's off to a good start. I want to manage your expectations. My expertise in your industry is I like food. Uh, I like to eat. Uh, but outside of that, I've learned things from people like Rory and CJ and others in here who are experts I've had a good chance to work with. Um, the question of vulnerabilities goes to the core issue of one of the challenges that we're facing as a country. And it's something that my colleague and friend here, has, uh, his country has said to us, uh, Korea next door has said to us and others, which is, you have a lot of what we need. You have a lot of what we need in, in, in the world. You have energy, uh, you have food, agriculture, you have critical minerals, but we're not sure you can get it to us. We're, we're just not sure you can get it to us. Uh, we saw the experience with the German Chancellor, came here, basically left empty-handed, but went all over the world and found it. It's uh, LNG supply. Similar experience just happened to your leader who was here. Same question, can you get me more energy? So the challenge, the greatest vulnerability for us is Canada's self-made problem <laughs> is we have not been able to build on the trade enabling infrastructure that's already in place. And the world's noticing. Our ports are gonna reach capacity in a matter of a decade or so. So whatever it is you're shipping over there, after some period of time, it will be sent down south to be shipped. And whose stuff do you think they're gonna ship first? This is an issue of not just national security, it's an issue of sovereignty. It is an issue of us and our capacity to control our own destiny, to leverage all of the things that the Almighty has given us in this country. We have it all. Uh, we've handicapped ourselves in many ways. We trade north-south. We've not been able to really build infrastructure to get product uh, to, uh, to, to the, in this case, Asia from, from, uh, from the West Coast. I don't think it's a role of government to determine what is a business case or not. We don't talk politics. We should leave the business to the business people to decide which uh, projects are worthy, which ones they should build. The role of government is to build the framework in which businesses can make decisions on the need of having regulatory predictability, regulatory stability, a depoliticized regulatory environment, and one that builds confidence that governments can come and go, but the credibility of a project that's been approved is going to stay. It is very difficult to be in a democracy today. Take a look at the Keystone experience from down south. It's on, it's off, it's on, and who knows, when, and off now, and who knows what happens next, right? In that environment, Capital is totally agnostic to ideology. It has a single purpose, return. And it will go where it can get it. Over the course of the last two, three decades, democracies have declined. There are less of us today than there were 20, 30 years ago. If you're keeping score, that means we're not doing so well. Why? And so these are things that you look at the vulnerability of this country. It is, we're doing it to ourselves, interprovincial trade barriers. We're a free trading nation outside of the country, just not inside the country. People notice, there are members of the diplomatic community here along with my friend who tell me, what is that? What, what are those? So those are the kinds of things where brand and reputation get affected because the world has become a very serious place. All that stuff that we've been doing since, you know, like it's been easy to do, lots to talk about, it's gotten a lot harder. And in the C-suite, and we can talk about this when we get to North America, the geopolitical risks are paramount today. Managing those, navigating those. There's a reason capital is in many ways frozen. There's estimated $200 billion in the pockets of Canadian businesses. Canadians have $300 billion in their pockets. You wanna talk about inflation risk, there's one. Um, it's frozen because they don't have confidence. Where do we go? Where do we go? 
the demand is high for everything I've mentioned. Energy, food, critical minerals. So this is our moment. It's not too late. We can do something about it. We need to take the politics out of our regulatory processes. We need to build confidence that we can build things again. Today, we wouldn't be able to build the National Highway or the Railway. Thank God we built it when we did, because it wouldn't be built today. So we have to be able to build trade-enabling infrastructure from roads to, to ports to train track, you name it. You know, the ring of fire, all the critical minerals are stored in the ground. There's no road, there's no train track, there's no agreements with Indigenous communities, and there's no access to a port. Other than that, we're selling them all over the world. <laughs> we're promoting them everywhere. How are we going to move them? That's what the issue is. Uh, thanks. We'll, uh, we'll come back to some of those uh, provocative points, I'm sure. Uh, and Master Theodore, who is over my shoulder here, um, is at the, of course at the center of where the international rules-based order is uh, is enforced, is uh, is discussed, and that is at our, as our ambassador to the WTO uh, in uh, in Geneva. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about the rules-based order, especially in the wake of the Trump administration, and I have some of the scars to prove that from my previous career, but. Um, this is something that where Canada has been consistent all along. First of all, we were involved in drafting a lot of these, uh, these rules, whether in the geopolitical organizations or in the economic and trade related ones. And, uh, and secondly, it is an important, the rules based order is an important counterweight for us, I would say, in our overwhelming uh, bilateral relationship with our, with our southern neighbor. So, Nadia Theodore, uh, you're at the center of that. Uh, we have uh, established a few years ago uh, a little group called the Ottawa Group of about 14 countries that's looking at modernizing uh, the WTO, uh, modernizing and giving, uh, giving more emphasis to dispute settlements uh, and, uh, and the like. Is that playing at all uh, into the global discussions on agriculture and, uh, and agri-food? And how would you see the, uh, the, any negotiations at, uh, at this point? When I was in, in government, we were always saying uh, in the door around that a breakthrough was just around the corner. Well, it was a breakdown, it wasn't a breakthrough. So we'd really welcome your comments. Well, yes. Um, can you hear me? First, let me just, yes. because we didn't do a mic check. Okay, great, excellent. Um, first, let me say it's, it's really a, a pleasure, pleasure to be here. I wish I could be there in person, but uh, et voila, here I am on the screen, so you'll have to settle for that. Um, maybe what I can say, and I thought that Goldie's comments were quite interesting. You know, he started off by saying his expertise is that he likes food, um, but I think that his broader context uh, is actually quite instructive to the conversation. And I have to say that I agree with a, a, much of what he said, but one thing in particular, and then one thing in particular that you, Senator Beam, said, and maybe that can be the jump off point to my, to my uh, answer to your question. You know, Goldie said, um, this is our time. Uh, and I 100% uh, agree with you on that, Goldie. And Senator Beam, you said, that you know the changing landscape when we talk about the rules-based international order in particular when it comes to trade and global economic governance um has been changing for some time but but you know really became acute uh in particular perhaps for canadians during the trump administration period and you said that you have the scars to show for it and uh so do i um you know at the time i was uh working in the deputy minister's office, and then soon after uh, went to serve as our consul general to the Southeast United States in Atlanta, covering uh, six states of the United States uh, in the deep South. Uh, and so it was indeed uh, a very interesting time to be talking about and promoting and advocating for uh, a rules-based trading system in the United States, and in particular in that area of the United States. Um, and I say that because I think that sort of, you know, what we're seeing, what, what I certainly saw when I was the Consul General in, in the Southeast USA, and even when I was working on, you know, a, a, lot, a long time ago on, on, on the TPP, uh, and then on trade files more generally uh, after that, um, you know, is really a microcosm of what we are now seeing at the World Trade Organization and the conversations that are going on here in Geneva when it comes to 
multilateral rules that govern trade, but in particular that govern trade and agriculture. Um, you know, it will come as a surprise to no one in the room who follows these negotiations that, you know, while there have been very important developments recently, uh, when we talk about trade and agriculture on the, on the multilateral uh, scene, uh, there really hasn't been anything truly transform transformative, um, and frankly, in a generation, if we're really honest with ourselves when it comes to agriculture. And, you know, you mentioned the Ottawa Group, uh, Senator, um, you know, and, and, and our work on reform is really about um, recognizing that across many areas, and trade and agriculture certainly is one of those areas, that reform and transformational change is needed on an urgent basis. And when we talk about agriculture in particular, um, you know, it really has an impact on three particular issues that are critical to our time that others have spoken about and will continue to speak about throughout the day. You know, food security, which is, you know, the big reason for, for this conference. But adjacent to that, frankly, um, climate change and, you know, this great power competition that we're seeing in the world. Um, and, you know, while there is agreement at the WTO that we need to ensure that the rules of trade really play a role in dealing with food security, climate change, um, you know, the, the how to do it hasn't really kind of been pinned down yet. And certainly the Ottawa Group is doing some work on that, but there are many other configurations of conversations that are going on uh, in Geneva that are really trying to dig in and double click on some of the, the, um, the tension points that are preventing us from, from getting to, to an agreement and a conclusion on, on trade and agriculture that really makes sense, um, not just for Canada, but frankly, for, for, for everybody. And, and can I just, before I close and, and you know, happy to, happy to talk, talk about it further and, and elaborate if you want, but I just wanted to also say one thing. You know, I think that when we think about trade and agriculture in the multilateral forum, and in particular here in, in Geneva and the conversations that are going on here, um, what is top of mind for us, frankly, is the fact that Russia's invasion of Ukraine was a shock, frankly, to an already strained food system. Um, that and, and, and we all know that, but frankly, the shock that it uh, reverberated across supply chains and the, the, the degree to which it impacted trade and the rules of trade was felt all around the world, but certainly hit home in Geneva quite acutely and led us to some very concrete action uh, last year uh, in dealing with that. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that perhaps a little bit later, but, but leave it there for now. Well, thank you very much. Let's go, uh, let's go high level. Ambassador, Prime Minister Kishida was just here two weeks ago. Um, was this subject discussed? Yes, of course, of course. And as just mentioned, this food security has an enormous uh, impact to the world. And country like us, we have to import a lot. But at the same time, when we talk about the global south, those developing countries in Africa or in Latin America, in Asia, they are suffering from the shortage of the food, not because of the production, but because of the access and also uh, supply chain. So I really think at this juncture, uh, we have to work very hard. When Prime Minister Kishida and Prime Minister Trudeau discussed this one very extensively in a big, bigger context, and G7 and also. And I, then based upon that, uh, why we are talking about this in, in Ottawa? Because Canada has enormous ability. I really think Canada can play a great role in this situation. Because I just mentioned our uh, food sufficiency rate is 38%. Yours, 250%. That is the biggest food, uh, food sufficiency rate in the world. Among the G7 countries, uh, only two countries are above 100%, France and the United States. Other G7 countries, less than 100%. 
Therefore, this food security is very, very serious matters, even for G7. But for other uh, developing countries, more, even bigger serious problems. Therefore, I really think, uh, in order to address this food security today, because the reason is a crisis and pandemic, and also the economic coercion and other things. But we have to do three things. First, we have to help developing countries. They are suffering a lot. The second, we have to make sure this trading system is very secure. WTO plays a very important role. But at the same time, we do have the many international organizations like FAO, WFP, and all the international organizations, including some experts from the private sectors and farmers. And they know how to do it. So this uh, uh, discussion in the international forum is very important. Um, so helping developing countries and trading system. And third, we have to transform agriculture as a whole into more uh, greener or sustainable agriculture. That is also very important. And then three things are going on and we have to facilitate it. Thank you. We'll come back to international uh, development as, uh, as well as International Development Week next week. And uh, some of us will be uh, celebrating that and thinking about, uh, about solutions. But Goldie, I wanted to go to you. You headed a, a business delegation to the what we call the NALS meeting in, uh, in Mexico City. Your, your sense of the vibe on, on food security and the agricultural discussions among, among the three uh, leaders three very different uh, individuals and really uh, President Lopez Obrador's uh, first uh, venture in a substantive way uh, into, uh, into these discussions. What, what are your conclusions from that? What do you draw from that? Let me, let me tie together what we've heard so far and, and the answer to that sure. question. I mean, how often do you hear the word security now? It's, it's so prevalent and national security equals economic security. Within economic security, you have energy security, you have food security, and a variety of other forms, right? The mindset, the shift that's taking place out there now is not short term. The realignment that's taking place globally is going to force us to think differently about the assets that we have. Let's face it, we've had a great run as Canada. We've had a great run. You don't have to do very much. You're attached to the G1. It's really not that hard. But now, <laughs> that's just, that country, coming to Nels here, <laughs> um, is not the same. Trade is a dirty word in America. I can't get a Republican or a Democrat to say it. I couldn't get the USTR to use the word trade when I met with them. It's called frameworks now, whatever those are. Right? This is the environment in which we're operating, where our 75% of our eggs are in one basket. You see the need to diversify? The Indo-Pacific strategy, good start. Now we need the infrastructure to get it there. Back to my earlier point. North America is probably the only place in the world um, that hasn't gotten with the program. The program going on globally is strength in numbers, blocks. Take a look at the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. 30% of the world's population, 30% of the world's GDP, inclusive of communist ideology like China, and democratic ideology like Australia in the same trade agreement. Block. The CPTPP, a block. Africa, we even have a continental free trade agreement within Africa, a block. I'm not saying these are all working well. <laughs> I'm just saying that attitudinally, they're starting to say strength in numbers and think regionally. But for whatever reason, North America has always been me, myself, and I. We compete internally. <laughs> we don't think about how to build trade enabling infrastructure to build integrity in our supply chains. I mean, thank you, uh, Keith Creel over at Canadian Pacific to at least build a railway that goes all the way from Mexico into Canada, uh, now called CPKC, I believe it is. We need way more of those kinds of things. We need, we need regulatory supply chains in terms of harmonization. I see uh, Richard back there about borders and harmonization and, uh, and, and, and ease of mobility. One of the things that came up uh, very clearly at North America at the, uh, at the, at the Leader Summit um, is labor mobility, actually. Everybody raced it. Everybody talked about the need to, to, to leverage our strengths. What are our strengths? People and natural resources. And through that, the ability to manage change, 
And there are so many transitions underway at the same time. And your industry and your, your industry is, is going through that as well. So the word security is one word I'm hearing a lot. The second word is the simple word and. In the polarized environment in which we are witnessing around the world, it's this or that, either or. <laughs> but the word and needs to be used a lot more. It's the economy and the environment. And I'd like to go uh, to both ambassadors uh, on this first. Yeah. Yes, and I just want to make one, one comment about you were you so referring to the block or regional comprehensive um, uh, uh, RCP, uh, economic partnership, and also TPP and WTO. And historically, WTO, uh, even before WTO, got GATT. And that is a facilitation of the global free trading system. And basically, almost every country joined it, regardless of the political institutions. Now, the members of the WTO is more than 160 countries. So they are enjoying the very basic free trade agreement, uh, free trade. But uh, based upon that, some of the groupings try to further freer trade. That is a sort of a starting point of the TPP or R RCP. It's not making a block. Because for, for, for countries like Japan, we're the member of WTO, we're a member of RCEP, and also we're a member of TPP. No contradiction about that. The thing is, we try to make trade freer, opener, and that's what it is. So of course, there's a certain sort of observation from the outside that might be the, as a uh, block. But when we say block before the World War II, today the block is something different. We are trying to organize it beyond the political institution. And also, as I just mentioned, Canada, you have 250% food sufficiency rate. That means you can eat only 100%. You have to export it. So therefore, this is a kind of a juncture between the, you just mentioned, this is a, uh, the security itself, food. And so uh, this is something we can, we can go beyond of the political sort of institution. Yeah. But at the same time, of course, today, it has a very serious geopolitical connotation. My only point is it's yeah. attitudinal in North America. We need yeah. to change the way we look at North America and think of ourselves, of course, we're gonna compete. We can compete inside Canada, we're gonna compete inside North America. But attitudinally, the shift is, we need to be stronger together. Our message in Washington is very simple. It's insufficient for America to be strong and Canada and Mexico to be weak. It's not in your national interest to build your success as you're trying to do with the Inflation Reduction Act, which is globally being saying, what the heck is this, right? I mean, you get everything and the rest of us get nothing? It's not, it's not good for you. Okay, right? yeah. Ambassador Theodore is eager to get in on this, I think. I really am because I'm smiling good. because I find it really interesting um, you know, how these types of conversations seem to just kind of um, reinvent themselves in, in uh, different but very much the same ways. I mean, listen, when we talk about North American integration and when we talk about Canada, United States and Mexico needing to work together and needing to see ourselves as a block, as a stronger together, as a, like whatever buzzword we want to use today, tomorrow or the next day, um, you know, this is not a new concept, frankly, and it is something, in fact, that we, as a tripartite um, uh, uh, group, Canada, the United, and the United States, and Mexico, are, frankly, the inventors of, um, dating back decades. And so, while absolutely in recent years, um, and I would, frankly, say, uh, as much fun as it is to perhaps um, start the conversation with the Trump administration, I would argue that uh, it started, you know, well before that, um, that folks, folks's um, uh, views around the benefits of deep tariff reductions and deep integration with a variety of countries around the world, regardless, um, you know, certainly have been and are changing in the United States. That is 100% your 100% right. Uh, I think it was Goldie that said it and perhaps Senator Beam even, even mentioned it as well. Um, but, but Canada, um, and I would say not humbly, obviously, and in particular, Canada's stellar trade negotiators have for a very long time 
been able to very successfully make the case, which you know Goldie has now um, um, uh, taken up uh, the banner on, that we are indeed stronger together. Not a new refrain, something that we have been saying for for decades again, um, and that that we have been very successful, frankly. Um, as negotiators in making uh, happen and in operationalizing, not just in our trade agreements in the NAFTA and then, and then the, the reconstruction of NAFTA, um, but in, 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 in side agreements, in informal uh, agreements, um, in understandings, in regulatory cooperation, in a variety of areas that really facilitate trade. I mean, everybody pays attention to the big uh, for some of us, sexy trade agreements, but there are a myriad, a myriad of tools in our toolkit when we talk about uh, working as an integrated North America, which I agree is is continues to be as important, perhaps if not more important today than it, than it what that it has been um, for time immemorial. Uh, the second thing that I just want to um, just underscore, if, if you'll allow me, Senator Beam. Um, is, you know, my, my, my colleague, um, uh, His Excellency uh, Ambassador Kanji mentioned this idea of sustainability and climate in his remarks. And I just wanted to take a couple of, a couple of minutes if I can, because I'm not sure that people caught that. And I think it is so important when we talk about the conversation, and I kind of touched on it in my opening remarks, but I think it bears us to just stop for a second and kind of dig in a little bit. Um, and so I thank him for, for raising it again, because when we talk about the importance of uh, conversations around sustainability and climate change, when we talk about food security, uh, and when we talk about trade and the intersections between those three things, you know, particularly in the multilateral negotiations, in multilateral fora, but not exclusively. There's a real tension there now that I think that, you know, we, we in Canada need to pay attention to. And, and the tension is, you know, some members want to focus on addressing climate change and sustainability, and they raise very, very legitimate concerns around that as it relates to food security and the ability to secure food for their populations. But they frame the conversation very much in a way that is a potential justification for ever new trade barriers and um, ever new increased flexibilities when we talk about trade and trade policy um, that is really uh, distorting. Um, and frankly, no good for export dependent countries uh, like, like Canada. So, you know, I hear very often here, well, you know, if subsidies are trade distorting, but environmentally beneficial, I mean, shouldn't that be encouraged because we have a climate crisis, right? So that's, that's one side of the coin when we talk about climate change and sustainability and, and trade and ag. And then on the other side of the argument where Canada sits and, and you know, many of our like-minded uh, in this space, um, you know, is, is an agreement that absolutely we have to have a conversation around trade and food security and agriculture and climate and the interaction between those three things. But we have to have the conversation Okay, the, the importance is to have the conversation in a way that is uh, a discussion on the positive and enabling role that trade can play to support action on what is a very real urgent issue. Food security, the, the, our, 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 our food security issues are not going away. Um, so absolute climate change is not going away, urgent issues. And we need to make sure that the conversation isn't used as a way to greenwash distortive agricultural sector subsidies and really distract us from what is really going back to, you know, our, the original point around the WTO, a very real mandated reform process when it comes to agriculture on how we're going to reduce these trade distorting supports thank, and protections. Thank you, thank you, Ambassador. I'm going to do what a committee chair does and I'm cutting you off, I'm sorry. Uh, but I wanted to get uh, about three minutes on the Indo-Pacific strategy and its uh, ramifications on agriculture, agri-food, export and trade. 
and then we'll go to questions from the from the floor. Um, Goldie, would you like to kick that off? Sure. Well, brief, uh, brief. Punchy. Yeah, it's come. This is good news. Uh, we have a strategy. Uh, I think we need to get going with it. Uh, I'm particularly keen on the trade mission next aspects of it. We had thrown out the Team Canada thing for whatever reason. Glad it's coming back. Um, anywhere I go, they say, come as sectors, come often. Uh, there's a lot of work, there's a lot of business opportunities around around the region. I mean, I'm just in India recently, and there's almost nothing they're not looking to, to get from Canada. So I think that's uh, that's fantastic news. Uh, I think the Minister Jolie, to her credit, deftly handled the situation with uh, with China. And what we had said all along as business leaders is um, we count on common sense to prevail through all of this. Common sense is Russia is not uh, sorry, China is not Russia. What happened in Russia, you can't do in China. <laughs> With the, the influence of the Chinese supply chain is through everything, and so the idea that that we're going to somehow you know delink all of these things or go through devolution the way it's being described, I don't think it works that way. Most businesses don't think it works that way. We need the supply chains, and uh, the customer ultimately will say, "I want whatever I want at the best price." You're not going to get it at the best price, and you know if you if you're doing it um, here, for example. So the logic will emerge that we will be able to trade uh, to Nadia's point, and that. Uh, you bring your best to that table, they bring their best to that table. You've seen the United States and China already on two separate occasions now turn the temperature down. Both the presidents have had two, and, and you can see why that's happening, because the reality hits. The reality of just how integrated we all are is very real. And that's where the rules matter to Nadia's point. I couldn't agree more. Sure. Okay, great. Ambassador so, so, Kanji. So about, about the Indo-Pacific strategy, and Japan also issued a national security strategy. And Canada and Japan work together. We set their action plans contribu contributing to free and open in the Pacific. They have six priority areas. Food security, we included it. And you just mentioned Prime Minister Kishida's visit. And Trudeau and Kishida talked a lot about how to make sure that all the world is, shouldn't be uh, hungry. And also we can work together to address this issue based upon those strategies. Great. Well, questions, comments, brick bets from the floor, please. And just identify yourself. Uh, hi, thank you. My name is Luke. I'm one of the students, uh, master's students from the University of Ottawa. So uh, my, stu uh, my question actually is for, for the entire panel, if you'd like to answer. I want to come back to the idea of blocks and uh, strength in numbers. Uh, in the current state of international politics, does this also bring uh, growing fears of these trade partnerships being used as uh, political leverage in certain regions, especially as food security becomes an increasingly uh, critical issue? And, you know, we can think about uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy being a response to the, uh, the, the road and belt that China has put forward. Anyone? Whether, this, uh, whether weaponization uh, of, uh, of food security is a, is a geopolitical issue. Maybe, maybe I can just, maybe I can just chime Go in. Go ahead, Ambassador. Yeah, that's what I was saying before I got cut off, so I can just continue. That's good timing. <laughs> Um, she's, she's let it go, that, Peter. She, no, no, that, she, she that, knows. It. This isn't the first time either. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. that, that, that indeed, you hit the nail on the head. I, can't, I didn't hear uh, the person who introduced himself. I think that they're a master's student, but I could have heard wrong. But the answer to your question, in my view, is absolutely yes. Uh, and we're seeing that weaponization, in particular when we talk about food security, and in particular when we talk about the intersection between food security and climate change. And this idea to use what are very real urgent concerns, urgent needing attention concerns, but to weaponize them either geopolitically or um, or and um, as a, as a as as a as a front to trade protection uh, and protectionist measures that for Canada um, in particular, but for I would say most countries around the world, if not all countries around the world, will have you end up worse than you started is absolutely a real threat. And I would say that the work at the WTO and multilateral conversations are what are necessary in order to stive those off. Um, these types of, of, of silly bugger games are best dealt with in a multilateral forum. Um, so, so that's what I would say. Thanks. I would add uh, something uh, uh, to this. I think the geopolitical landscape in terms of tactics and issues has also really changed, and particularly since the, uh, the invasion of Ukraine by the Russian Federation. Who would have thought that the broker would be Turkey to, uh, to ensure 
uh, that grain shipments would go through the Black Sea and through the Dardanelles, uh, the Bosporus. Um, it would have made sense to think, oh, of course, Turkey could be a player, but then this also shifts into a NATO uh, discussion. I know, know we're not here to talk about NATO, but on the admission of Sweden and Finland, and then who would have thought that someone burning a Koran could, in, the, in Stockholm could tip this whole thing out of, out of balance. So uh, there are a lot of factors out there that we, I think, uh, in governments have not seen coming, uh, and that presents challenges as well. Over here at the microphone, sir. Thank you. Uh, Roger Larson, Dean's Council Agriculture, Food and Veterinary Medicine. Um, Goldie, you were talking about su supply chains and global supply chains, um, and that we're not going to change that. I think there are supply chains and there are critical supply chains. Yeah. And the challenge is how do you ring fence things like food security or uh, pandemic preparedness uh, and vaccines um, and sometimes with our friends as well as our potential opponents because we know that Mr. Trump uh, declined to share his vaccines with us. So any comments on? Yeah, so let's, let's, let's take the pandemic example that, that, um, that you just said. We had a government in the United States that wanted to stop masks from coming into Canada. And so we called them up and said, do you know the paper in those masks? It comes from a mill in British Columbia. So don't worry about canceling the mask, we're canceling the paper. I mean, it was just a stark reminder of how connected we are. You know, a ventilator has 1400 parts. Do you really think you're gonna make one by yourself? Do you think anybody's gonna make one by themselves? This is what I meant by business's attitude of common sense. Eventually the facts just emerge and they are what they are. We are living in an environment. Yes, it's changing. It's not the first time, by the way, the geopolitical change is happening. Uh, it's how you manage that. And this is where we think over time, the facts will dictate that trade is good, that we actually do need uh, you know, rules uh, by which we can operate. Maybe, you know, I mean, look at who's challenging the rules. The architects of the in infrastructure, <laughs> the Americans, are saying, we want to do away with the WTO and start all over again. Really? So we've got to bring some common sense back to this, this conversation so we can demonstrate to people. And I think the most important thing here is the consumer. You see what happened in Europe. We're going too fast on renewables. We're going to turn off everything else, coal and everything else. We should, I understand we should take off coal. Too bad we can't get them LNG to do that. Um, what happened? Natural gas prices went up four, five, six hundred percent. And the customer said, I can't do this. I can't pay for this anymore, so forget whatever it is, turn it all back on. The Saudi Aramco minister said a little while ago, he said, uh, he said, there's a transition underway, all right? Many parts of the world, back to coal. So why is that? Because the customer said, I can't afford it anymore. And so we've got to bring people with us. This is where the role of a government and business community and labor and others to partner, to be genuine in their partnership, like they were in COVID. For all the things that government did that were good in COVID, there's not a lot of attention paid to what businesses did during COVID. They're the ones who made the PPEs when they were short in supply. They're the ones who invested in the broadband to make sure you could work, uh, work on Zoom. They're the ones who gave mortgage relief without any you know, regulation or anything like that. I can, go, I can go down a long list of what took place. That partnership is what kept Canadians safe and, and built confidence at a time of a crisis. Why do we act like that just in a crisis? Why can't we do that all the time? Thank you. We're coming down to three minutes. So, Ambassador, do you have yes, any closing yes, yes. thoughts on yeah, this? Uh, for, um, and then we'll go to Ambassador Theodore. Uh, for, 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 from the Japanese point of view, the, the Canada is affluent on the food and, and uh, the energy. But the one challenge is transportation. Because uh, for, for us, West Coast has to be the, the, the departure point. But the, your resources are inside, and especially uh, plains, provinces. So there are the certain challenges stores for, for those uh, transportation. So the access is very, very important. Now for food and energy. So we really wish the, uh, the Canadian government and private sectors uh, try to improve infrastructure and transport uh, transportation from the middle to the west of course. That's uh, sort of my answer to the question. Any last thoughts, my, uh, my friend in Geneva? Only to say that I 100% agree with Goldie on his point about being genuine in partnership. Uh, I think Canada can do much better, um, and I would 100% agree with him that that is frankly uh, our way forward. 
Thank you. We did not get to international development in a, in a significant way, and I know this is not the, the purpose of this, uh, this forum, but uh, you've heard uh, Ambassador Yamanuchi's statistics about Canadian production, and I think as a, as a citizen uh, of the world, uh, Canada has an obligation to continue to support the World Food Program, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, and other agencies that are very, uh, very active because there is a great need in many places. We're a rich country. We can do that. So with that, back to you. Please join me in thanking the panel.